book of Luke chapter 12, and let's go to verse 49. The Bible reads this way, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. Then how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, and the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You may be seated. Jesus said in verse 50, He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to give you peace on earth, I tell you, no, but rather division. For a few moments tonight, I'd like to preach to you on this thought. Truth comes with a cost. Truth comes with a cost. This 12th chapter of Luke is a chapter that is rich in information. It's rich in instruction that Jesus is speaking directly to the people without trying to uh, put it in flattering words, but He's really getting down to the brass tacks of what it's all about. As He is dealing with His disciples and He is dealing with His people, He is telling His disciples not to be hypocrites in this chapter. He is telling folks not to be covetous of things. He tells us how to be faithful and wise stewards. And then where I read to you, He talks about to us that there will be divisions because of the gospel. In an environment where we are looking for peace, in an environment where we're looking for everybody just to be able to get along, we find that Jesus has told us that for the majority it's going to be impossible. Because houses will be divided because of Him. People will be at odds because one will believe this way, one won't believe at all, and another will believe in a radical idealism. We live in a messed up world. And it's a messed up world because we've got messed up people. You know, I don't... I don't know no other way to say it. But people are messed up today. There are so many thoughts and so many uh, ways that people are trying to justify themselves that, you know what? They're believing themselves right out of heaven. They're believing themselves right out of a walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I was reading in this chapter and there was something that struck out at me as I was just going through this thing and Jesus began to talk and and he was talking to people and um, he said that you know this life is basically not about what you possess your possessions mean nothing is what Jesus said he didn't put you here or put me here to build up a lot of possessions to ourselves But isn't that what we try to do? Isn't that what we try? People are just killing themselves for the dollar, for gold. People are killing themselves to just build up for themselves treasure here where they won't have to worry 
You realize that treasure causes you more stress because you're more worried about somebody taking it than you are spending it. Because what I find out is that people that have a love for finances, they don't, they don't want to spend it. They'd rather do without than to spend. They'd rather close the bowels of compassion than to spend. That's a problem. In the church age, in the church world today, in that people just have so many ideals that, you know, we think we're going to take all of our possessions with us and pile it up in our mansion in glory. Well, your mansion in glory don't have room for temporal things. And those temporal things are going to pass away. But you know what I preached on that Sunday? And we're going to move on and preach on something else tonight. But Jesus is just talking. He's, he's just giving. He's just going down the line and He's saying, I need you to listen to what I'm telling you. I need you just not to say, I hear you, Lord. I need you to grasp an understanding of what I'm saying to you. Is that in this life and in this world, we're going to have sorrow and we're going to have trouble. And that trouble is going to be caused because of Jesus. Now, I don't look at Jesus as a troublemaker in my life. I don't look at Jesus as one who causes me trouble because I've aligned my heart and my mind with Him. I've aligned my way with Him. I've submitted myself unto the teachings of Jesus Christ the Lord. I've submitted myself to His direction. I've submitted myself to His correction. Oh, there's the big one. Because we don't like to be corrected. I've submitted myself to His guidance. To His instruction. And we definitely live in a world today where folks don't like nobody to tell them what they should or shouldn't do. But I'm going to tell you something. We can't follow Jesus without submitting to His counsel. We cannot have a stubborn will and follow Jesus. We cannot have that stubbornness in us that keeps us from achieving what the Lord wants us to do and cobble out our own way and expect Jesus to be proud of it because He's not. Jesus said this. He said, I'm come to send fire on the earth and what will I if it already be kindled? You knew the Jews or you know the Jews or if you don't know, you're fixing to find out. The Jews associated fire with judgment. And so Jesus is looking at them, and they're thinking maybe in this realm, Jesus is saying, well, I'm fixing to unleash judgment on the earth. I'm fixing to right all the wrongs. Well, that had made somebody happy and some of them not so happy. But then some would suppose that Jesus could have been talking about in fire because the Holy Ghost is represented by fire, that He was going to unleash the Holy Ghost on the earth in the lives of the people. Or maybe Jesus was saying, you know what? The fire is going to be the good news of the gospel that I'm bringing to you. But what Jesus was saying that I, when He was going to bring the fire, what He was saying is, He said, I'm going to be immersed in this fire. I'm going to be immersed in my heart and my life is at a place that, uh, that I'm in a straight about it till it be accomplished. And what Jesus was saying is, I can't wait to get it done. Because if I get this done, it's going to be better for you. Amen. When I do this thing, it's going to make things a whole lot better because I'm going to give you power. But what Jesus was saying is that we ought not to be afraid of the fire. We ought not to be afraid to be immersed in the fire as He was. To be immersed in the power of God as He is. To be immersed in the truth as He is. And what we find today, there are so many truths. I use that word loosely right here. There are so many truths in the church world today. What is the truth? I believe we could really identify with Pilate when Pilate said, what is truth? You remember when he asked Jesus that question? What is truth? 
You've got your truth. They've got their truth. I've got my truth. But what is the truth? But what Pilate didn't re recognize is that he was looking at the truth. He was looking at the only truth. And I want you to understand tonight, there's only one truth here. There is only one way, one certified way, if you will, for the church. There's only one certified way, one accepted way of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes through Jesus. There is no other truth other than Jesus Christ the Lord. But we find today that we've got so many variations of what people believe that it's hard to find two people that would believe the same way. It's hard to find a group of people, a congregation of people that will believe the same way because we've got so many nuances of the faith. And I think about those things, those nuances don't bother me. What I understand is that we've got to all agree on the absolutes in the Word of God. It's the, when the church gets in trouble. It's when the church begins to pervert the absolutes. When the church begins to look at things and tries to water it down to make everything easy about Jesus Christ the Lord. I want you to understand tonight, Calvary wasn't easy. What Jesus endured to get to Calvary wasn't easy. And what the apostles went through after Calvary, after the resurrection, wasn't easy. Eleven of them are martyred. One only dies of old age. But they put their lives on the line for something they believed in. And what was that? It was the truth that they were taught of Jesus Christ the Lord, that only the pure in heart shall see God. That only them that have an affinity and affection for Jesus Christ to do His will and to do His way will be welcomed into the kingdom of God. That only those that take this word and they apply it to their hearts, that they'll be allowed to enter the city of God. But what we find today in, in our age and in our time is that we want to split hairs so much. Well... We want, to, we want to argue about what color Jesus was. I mean, I, I've heard that argument. Jesus was a Jew. We settled. We want to argue over all kind of foolish things. We want to argue we can do this and we can do that. Look, there are things that the Bible is absolute on and there are things the Bible is silent on. And you know what we like to argue about, don't you? The silent things. You know what that says to me if the Bible is silent on it? It means that if you've come to a place in prayer and understanding with the Lord Jesus Christ and He's dealt with you on it, that's where you need to be. But that is you. That's where we work out our salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. That we allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit of God. You know, there are things that I can't do that you do. And there are things that I do that you can't do. And it's okay. But we're not going to judge one another of it. But that's where division comes in. That's where all of this anxiety and stress of the faith comes in because we want everybody to be like us instead of everybody being like Jesus. I'm not here to be like you. And I don't want you to be like me. I'm trying my best to follow Jesus. I'm trying my best to be what Jesus wants me to be. But what I understand is, in all of these divisions within the church, that's why we've got so many denominations out there today, because the truth has divided people. That families argue amongst themselves about what is right and what is wrong. And who gets the glory from that? How does Jesus, how is Jesus glorified in that? What we ought to understand is that we all need to agree that He is the virgin born Son of God. 
that He came to this earth and lived without sin. And He died without sin. And He rose again without sin. And He's called us out of sin. And He's called us to live a peculiar life. I was talking with Brother Morris, Kenny Morris the other day. And I'd heard him make mention of the word weird. We hear that word a lot in church, don't we? They're weird. You know, Christian people like to call people that don't believe like they believe weird. Say amen because it's the truth. And Brother Kenny said, I got to looking up that word. I got to thinking about that word. You know, the Bible says we're peculiar. But a lot of folks like to say that word peculiar means weird, but that word peculiar just means we're a possession of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means. But that word weird, if you go back, I believe it's uh, originated in a German word that's W-I-R-D is what he said. And he said that word has its roots in witchcraft. That it means to be involved in witchcraft. And so there's nothing about the church that is weird. The world might be weird, but the church ain't weird. A sinner lost and undone involved in the dark things of this world might be weird. But the child of God is not weird because we're not involved in witchcraft. We're involved because in being peculiar because we belong to Jesus Christ. Because we've been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we've been anointed to be the sons and daughters of God. And we've been them that's been anointed to be the priests, to be the pre- to be the singers, to be the testifiers, to be the worshipers. We've been anointed to do all of these things. That's why we're a peculiar treasure unto Him. But we even get divided up on our worship because this one don't want to praise Him and this one does. And this one don't know what they want to do. You find all these divisions in the house of God. And the only one that is being glorified when the midst of division is the devil. When we allow him to manipulate our minds. When we allow him to run away with our minds. And you know what? We allow the devil to run away with our mind. We allow the devil to run away with accusation in our mind. We allow the devil to run away with propaganda in our mind. We allow the devil to build cases in our mind against people that ain't even done nothing to us. The devil will plant a seed. He'll water that seed. And he'll grow that seed of confusion. And that seed of confusion begins to grow and it begins to produce fruit. And after a while, you can't get along with nobody because you think everybody's got something against you. You really think you're that special? Do you really believe that everybody just spends their whole day thinking about how much that they don't like you and love to see you fall? That's vanity. Because you're thinking a whole lot more of yourself than you ought to. There's nobody within the church that loves Jesus Christ want to see you hurt, want to see you fall, want to see you this or that. They only want your best. But you know what they're doing? They're trying to live life just like you are. They're trying to get through this thing just like you are. They're fighting the devil just like you are. They got problems just like you do. They got hurts just like you do. They got anguish just like you do. And you want to pile on and say, nobody likes me? No, 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 no. That ain't God. That ain't the church. That's the devil. And we listen to it. And we allow it to fester in our minds. Jesus instructed us or the word of God instructs us that we're to resist those things. We're to resist contentions. Contentions not of God. 
The Holy Ghost is not in contention. The Holy Ghost is not in ill will. The Holy Ghost is not in hatred. The Holy Ghost is not in pouting. The Holy Ghost is not being ugly and in, in, in uh, 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 supportive of being ugly one toward another. You say, Brother David, why are you preaching this? Two reasons. First of all, it's where the Lord brought me. Second of all, it's the truth. Because these things happen because you know what? If the enemy can get contentions in the church, he'll destroy the church from the inside out. I want you to understand our hardest battles are not from the outside. Our hardest battles are from the inside. It's easy to fight those on the outside. But you allow something to go on the inside and have to fight within the inside. That's hard. Because there's more at stake from fighting from the inside. It hurts more. And so the enemy stirs up all of those things. But I know something else about fire. Fire purges. Fire cleanses. And if Jesus went through this baptism and faced everything in the wilderness that he faced uh, when, he con- when the devil confronted him, it means Jesus said, now I've immersed myself in this fire. I'm going to show you how to go through this fire so you can go through the fire that you don't have to fall in it. You don't have to be consumed in it. You don't have to be burnt by it. You don't have to smell like it. You can come through it if you'll just follow my lead. But truth has a cost. Truth will separate you from people. Truth will separate you from toxic things. Come on. I'm preaching straight. But folks, eternity is so close. I don't have any other... Avenue to go. But to tell it just as simple and straight as I know how to tell it. Truth. Sometimes it hurts. The results of truth hurt sometimes. But the after effects of it gives you peace. Because sometimes we don't like to go let go of toxic things. Sometimes we like to hold on to things that we don't need to hold on to. And the Holy Ghost is telling us, you need to get away and you need to stop that. And you need to quit being that way and you need to quit doing this. I'm trying to deal with you. I'm trying to help with you. But you don't want to let go. Come on. But sometimes Jesus gets in there and says, you know what? I've seen families can't get together. You know... You know, when my daddy got saved, he went to the holiness church. And my mama went to the Baptist church. She went to First Baptist here in Bladenburg. When daddy got saved in 1964 at New Light, daddy started going to the holiness church. Started going over there to Bethel, as good as I can remember. So mama went to the Baptist church. She took me with her to the Baptist church. And Daddy went to the hole in his church and Dale went with him. I don't know where Greg went. I think he went to Galilee. But there came a day. It was a house divided. I'm not saying nothing about the Baptist. I'm not saying nothing about the holiness. It was just two different styles of believing. Two different things of believing. But there came a day when my mama decided, I'm tired of my house being divided. And we're going to go to church together. And I was happy about it, Sister Daniel. Because them pews at the First Baptist Church was just that hard. And they creeped every one of them. And you could change your mind in that creek. 
And when I changed my mind, my mom would pinch me. At four and five years old, three, four, five years old, you change your mind a lot. I got pinched a lot. And I'd say, oh, and she'd pinch me again and tell me to hush. Because you didn't make noise in the Baptist church. It was irreverent to make noise in the Baptist church. And man, when we went to Bethel, them pews were still as hard, but I could slide from one end to the other and they didn't, nobody didn't know it and I was ready to shout. I didn't get pinched near as much at Bethel as I did the Baptist church. To a little old five-year boy, that was utopia. Hallelujah. They so loud, mama can't even hear me changing my mind. I could wiggle all I wanted to. And it was good. But there was a distinct difference. They weren't making noise. They were praising God. We get hung up on some crazy stuff. And we get put out by some crazy stuff. And we get divided by some crazy stuff. And you know what that division does? It causes contention. It causes bitterness. It causes anger. And it causes people to have a contentious spirit. But I'm fixing to tell you something. It ain't going to sit too well with you. That bitterness, that contention tension and that ill will ain't going to go to heaven. That ugly spirit ain't going to go to heaven. Being brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ the Lord means that we need to find common ground and get along. But in this position I mean I've fought more than I've ever fought in my life. I've had to pray more for the Lord to help me have a right spirit than I've ever prayed in my life. I've had to pray for God to not to let me hate people more than I've ever had to pray in my life. But I can stand before you tonight and tell you God kept me through it. And there ain't nobody I hate. There ain't nobody that I've prayed ill will toward. That I've prayed for God to help them. That's right. Because it ain't worth it. It ain't worth carrying that seed in me that'll do more damage to me than it does to anybody else. When you sit there and you hold things in your heart against people, it ain't hurting them. It's hurting you. Because you just, let me use it this way, you just cutting your nose off to spite your face. What I found out, people are going to be people. And you know what? You people too. And so, you nor me are exempted from that statement of people are going to be people because you're going to do some boneheaded things in your life. And what do you want people to do? Do you want them to be aggravated with you? Or you want them to forgive you? You want them to hold contempt in their heart toward you? Oh, it's easy for us to walk around. Oh, I don't hate nobody. But you wouldn't spit on them if they was on fire. We like to lie to ourselves. That we good. That we good. But we'll burn them up. We'll burn them up. Talk about them up one side and down the other. Just, just lay into them. I'm going to tell you a little secret. You want me to tell you a little secret? It ain't going to be a secret after I tell it. But I'm going to tell you anyway. That if they'll talk to you about somebody, they'll talk about you to somebody else. Oh, Lord, let's make it personal. Why don't we? And if you'll talk about somebody, 
somebody going to talk about you. And you have no right to get mad when they do it. But we do. <laughs> I think you pretty much know me. If I got something to say, I'll say it to you. You know? Ain't no use in letting it burn me up. Brother Doug, I can say in all honesty, there have been times I've been going to go to people and say something, and I was going to lower the boom on them. And the Holy Ghost will hit me and say, there used to be a time you'd pray about it and let me do it. And I said, yes, sir. And he did it. So now when I feel them feelings coming on, I just go to God. When I feel them feelings coming in my heart, coming in my mind from the enemy, when he's trying to scramble my station, I just go to the Lord. Because I know people's going to be people. And people's going to do stuff I don't like. But you know what I know? I'm going to do stuff people don't like. I am. And what am I going to do? Stop living? Man, I can't run around. I can't run around saying, Oh God, am I going to offend this one? Am I going to offend that one? I can't live my life like that. I can promise you I'm going to do me. I'm going to be me. Because I've got to trust who God is making me. I've got to trust what Jesus is doing in my life. Because I know He crucified the old David. I know the old David died. And there's a new David that's alive. So the new David's looking for the counsel from Jesus Christ the Lord. So I've got to trust what Jesus is doing me. That's why I can feel good about just doing me. Because I want to lift Him up. And if somebody disagrees with me about who Jesus is... You know what? I ain't going to fall down. I used to argue about it. I used to be so bad, I'd print off Scripture on the copier and hand it to people and say, there it is. Help us, Lord. Yeah, I would. And I was too dumb enough to realize, or too zealous enough either way, to realize I was doing more harm than I was good because I had an argumentative spirit. I was arguing the Word of God. I was arguing to be right. I wasn't arguing to help somebody understand. I was arguing to be right. How many of y'all admit something like that? Because people don't like to be corrected. And people don't like to be wrong. I'm wrong. I know I make mistakes. I got the fact check, fact checking station over there. I know when I say something, I can see Ethan's eyes start rolling. I'll see, I'll see uh, Riley's head start running around. I'll see their head drop. And they fact checking daddy. But I don't stop preaching. And I don't get mad at them. If I find out I'm way off, I'll tell you, hey, I was wrong. We'll fix it. They're doing it. Trying to help me. The ego would say, ah, you know what? People's wrong every day. But I am in a business that I can't afford to be wrong. Are we not? In this gospel business? We can't afford to be wrong. We can't afford to allow our ego to get in the way. We can't allow our pride to get in the way. Because when we allow that to get in the way, we're going to turn somebody off of Jesus. We're going to turn somebody off of this way. And we got a haughty attitude, a smart attitude, or a smart mouth. We don't need those things in the house of God. That's what the world does. We don't need to cut one another. We don't need to be... Uh, ill toward one another. We don't need to be aggravated with one another. We're supposed to be born again. 
We're supposed to forgive 70 times 7 in a day. We can't even get to half. I'm talking about half of one. You say, Brother David, why are you preaching this? Because we don't get hear this stuff preached in church. We don't hear this stuff in the house of God. Because when I think about them Beatitudes that Jesus talked about in chapter 5 of Matthew, there's a, there's a reason they're called Beatitudes. Because it's the things that He wants us to be. But there's a lot of, everybody in this church has got an attitude. But what's that attitude tempered with? Is it tempered with grace? Or is it tempered with self-absorption? Is that legitimate? And I, I just don't want us to have a church. I, I love that we can shout. I love that we can move under the inspiration of God when it gets high. But you know what else I'm concerned about? I'm concerned about how we live when we get out there. I'm concerned about how we act when the fire falls out there. And I'm not talking about a holy fire. I'm all about how we're going to handle the stresses and the pressures of life when we get out there and we get so aggravated we want to choke somebody. And it happens. Because you feel those emotions. You feel... You feel that rising up in yourself. Mm. I've even heard him say, I've even heard a fella say one time to somebody, if I want sanctified, I'd fry your jaws. I want sanctified in the heart. I want sanctified in the heart. And we can laugh at that and that feels comical, but we do, we do just as bad when we have that ill will toward. You see, we're supposed to defend all of God's children, not just the ones we like. Church, how are we going to be a church? How are we going to be a people of God? How are we going to stand the test if we don't attach ourselves to the truth? If we're not willing to stand by the truth, wherever the truth puts us. And the truth of the matter is, is that when it gets hard, when it gets rough, when it gets bad, we've got to swallow hard and ask Jesus to help us to get through it without proving ourselves to be a donkey. But you know what I find? There's a whole lot of eon going on. Really? Really? People don't care about their witness. They don't care about their testimony. They don't care that they just stood up in church. Oh, I love God and I love everybody. And then when you get out there and you just derail them because they did something you didn't like. Oh, you want me to give you a perfect one? Now, I tell you what, I got so aggravated the other day, I just got off the phone with a fella. I did. I just got to a place where I was just at a loss for words. He had me so aggravated. That star telephone. I was trying to get that fixed over in the fellowship hall. Get that Wi-Fi fixed over in the fellowship hall. And I tried to be nice and respectful to him. Yes, sir. You know, this is what I got. And could you please send somebody? And he's looking at me and he says, Well, that router ain't ours. I didn't ask you about a router. I said, I just want you to go out there and fix the problem. Well, if we go out there and find a problem, it might cost, we might have to charge it. I didn't ask you how much it was costing. I want you to go fix the problem. Well, I don't know. Uh, all we is responsible for is the line. I said, the line ain't working. <laughs> well, I, I don't know who put the line in. I said, we pay you the bill. <laughs> and I'm just standing out there in the middle of the driveway. You know, I just about see myself standing beside me. I was beside myself. 
I was aggravated with that dude. Hey, I tell it straight. I tell it honest. I didn't talk ugly to him. I didn't talk hateful to him. I didn't get short or curt with him. I re- gave him respect the whole phone call. And then I said, well, what am I supposed to do? You know what he told me? Well, I don't know. <laughs> and I just... <laughs> Dear God, I got trouble. And this guy's supposed to be telling, be able to fix what I got wrong, and he don't even know what to do. So you know what I did? I just said, okay. And then I called some, I I, I saw somebody else, and I said, bud, that star telephone's a joke. I hope they listening. Because they they don't need to send me a survey. Because they'll flunk it. The guy that come yesterday won't, because he's nice. He's good. He fixed my problem. But I had to get somebody that knew somebody to get somebody out here to do something. Stuff like that will drive you bonkers. And it happens to us every day, don't it? When's the last time you drove somebody bonkers? I bet you don't even know you drove them bonkers. When's the last time you drove somebody to almost stand there and see themselves standing beside themselves and they just want to look at you and go, what I want you to understand is, is that Jesus has called us to dwell in truth. And the truth will separate us from some things. And we get mad sometimes because somebody else's truth is not our truth. Well, let me tell you something. The truth don't belong to me and the truth don't belong to you. The truth is of God. And we're to tell His truth. I made up my mind, Brother Doug, a long time ago after I got saved, I made up my mind that when I was telling Something, telling an account that dealt with me or deals with anybody that I was going to tell it straight down the middle. And if it hurt me, if it indicted me, it indicted me. And if it exonerated somebody else, it exonerated them. But I was going to tell it straight down the middle to the best of my ability just like I knew it happened. Because a lot of times we like to tell our truth. In our truth, we're always the victim. In our truth, it's always somebody else's fault. In our truth, we're helpless and we need somebody to feel sympathetic for us. But the truth doesn't do that. The truth calls us out and our character reveals in us how we're able to bear the truth. So I'm preaching tonight to remind you that our character as children of God matters. The truth matters. The truth is imperative. You know why the truth is so important? I'm going I'm to stop. Because Revelation 21, 7 and 8 says, You lie, you fry. That's the David Clue's standardized version. It really says all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. But it doesn't all just say about liars. It talks about the fearful you know, the unbelieving. You know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people will have their part in the lake of fire. But it's interesting to me that truth kicks it off.
That's why Jesus had such a problem with the church. It's because the church wanted it to be about them and not him. A church that is about its works and not about the Savior is a dead church. A church in your secular program is greater than your spiritual program is a dead church. You know what Jesus called the church to do? To win souls. That's the primary calling of the church. To win the lost. That is the primary calling of the church. To win the lost. All these other things are good. But you don't ever lose the the focus point. Those that are lost. It's truth. The truth separates. The truth divides. The truth divides houses. The truth divides the children from the parents and the parents from the children. Basically because it's just hard for people to accept the truth sometimes. I've tried my best to help you understand. I've tried my best to get an everyday living tonight. Because that's where it's it. That's where we are. In everyday living. In church, we gotta we gotta be grounded, don't we? We gotta be grounded. <laughs> That little old red rocket, that little old red bomber I got. That Riley's driving. I've rebuilt the motor in that truck. You know, stuff happens, no big deal. But when I got that truck back, I'd done something wrong in the motor, so I had to take it back. Say, fix what they did wrong in the motor. Well, be riding down the road and that thing would cut off. So I let it coast. You know, one day I just coasted to the house and made it to the garage and tried it and it cranked up. And so I learned if I just let it coast a minute, I could throw it in neutral and it cranked back up. So it didn't bother me. It's left me beside the road more than one time. You know, and I've, I've, I've had to walk and had to call and all of these things. And So I took it to the mechanic. Hey, good old boy. He said, I think it's the computer. So he changed the computer. He cut off again. Well... It was, I think it's something else. And he did something else and put something else in it. He said, I believe I got it this time. Cut off again. Went back, got studying on thing. He said, I believe I got it this time. He said, you had that motor rebuilt? I said, yeah. He said, that's what it was. There was paint under the ground wire at the block. It ain't cut off no more. Took me a few hundred dollars to find that ground wire with a little bit of paint, you know, just a scraper and a a, 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 a socket. You know, tighten it back up. We done. But I got me. And now I got people say, boy, you sell that truck I wanted. I say, you don't want it for what I got in it. (laughs) But if you give me what I got in it, I'll give it to you. If you ever want to sell it, let me know. Got to drive it a while now. I could lie. And I could do it. No, ain't no use in it. Let's be honest. I didn't get mad at the mechanic. He's doing the best he knew how to do. He was just trying to find a problem. I didn't get mad at him. (laughs) Obviously, because I kept taking it back to him. Truth, folks. Truth has a cost. 
And sometimes it costs you more than you want it to cost you. But it will never bankrupt you. The truth will never bankrupt you. Let's all stand. Folks, we focus on a lot of things. But I've went after them little foxes tonight. I went after them babies tonight. Them little pups. Because it's the little things that mess things up. You know, Brother Corey, people get excited over little things a whole lot more than they do big things. They'll work something big out. But you let something happen that's trivial and <clears throat> Ian, that's Riley, ain't it? No, it's just, no, that's Riley. <laughs> you let something trivial and Ian happen? How do you like that one, Ian? I'll just give you the last two letters. And it blows it all out of the water. Something so easy to fix. Something so easy to correct. And we let it wreck our lives. Is that what Jesus wants us to do? Is that the way Jesus wants us to be? We got to get to a place, folks, where we want His truth and the consequences of His truth more than we want anything else. Whether it's at my expense, your expense. It's not too big of a price to pay to get to the truth of Jesus Christ and to allow His truth to operate in you. Amen. That's what it's going to take to get to heaven, folks. There'll be a lot of things that people tell you, but you listen to this preacher right here, this old country preacher right here. I'm telling you, unequivocally, without exception that it's going to take the truth of who Jesus Christ is to get us to glory. Let's live in it. Let's abide in it. Let's allow it to lead us that He would ever be lifted up. Altars are open tonight. Let's come have a season of prayer. And ask the Lord just to help us to get to His truth and live in His truth to the best of